morning friends. Today we have a lecture on reading films, the miss on scene. This lecture is by Dr. Mithuraj Dusia, who is an associate professor in the Department of English at Hansraj College, University of Delhi. Uh, his interest in cinema uh, is a very long interest and as a colleague in the same university, I have had numerous occasions to interact with him. He is the author of, uh, of the book Indian Horror Cinema, Engendering the Monstrous. This was a Routledge publication in 2018. Of course, he has been publishing regularly uh, uh, articles on Indian cinema and presented various uh, papers in seminars both nationally and internationally. Uh, he has another dimension to him. He is the executive member of the Delhi University Teachers Association, uh, which is, uh, and he's also currently the academic council member in Delhi University. Uh, but his uh, interest and his enthusiasm for cinema and film studies is infectious and uh, we have had, we have shared uh, many moments uh, of very interesting conversation and discussions with him. His lecture today is on Miss On Sen, which will uh, take us to one of the very important aspects of film studies and the language of cinema, which anybody who is interested in studying or reading cinema uh, would, would, would be, uh, uh, it would be paramount for, for somebody uh, to know this aspect of the language of cinema. So, uh, for you, all of you, uh, I present uh, Dr. Mithuraj Dusia. Hello, everyone. I'm Mithuraj Dusia. I'm really happy and feel privileged to be a part of uh, this refresher course. I thank profusely the Teaching Learning Center Ramanujan College, uh, Dr. Nirmalya Samanto, and the whole team that, uh, that has worked tirelessly beyond, uh, behind the creation of this uh, refresher course and I am sure the, uh, all of you will be extremely benefited by all the lectures of all other resource people including mine. So without wasting time I would like to uh, begin my lecture. The title of the lecture, my, the title of my talk or lecture is Reading Films, The Mizose. Now. I'll, I'll begin, I'll begin to see, uh, we go like this, I'll talk a bit and then I'll actually ask you people to see clips, I'll show you clips and then we'll discuss it. So it will keep on happening intermittently. We'll begin with the title of my paper, why is it mentioned reading films? See all of us, no matter which uh, discipline we belong to, have always been trained to read things, either as part of book or magazines right from our childhood, need not be academic at all. You read film books, you read uh, academic books, you read textbooks. But now we are seeing something called reading films, right? Now uh, you see there is a lot of difference between a literary author, a literary piece of work and film and the filmmaker of course. Unlike a literary author, a film maker or a film, unless a written, uh, unlike a written piece of work, a film is an industry. Yes, we all know, we all understand, we all acknowledge an author is dead, as far as Roland Barth says. But at the same point of time, when we talk about films, it's a larger industry. Specifically focusing on Indian cinema, you would find that we also have different people associated with different parts of the film. So we have a choreographer, we have an action director, we have uh, your lyricist, you have the singer and of course besides production managers and everything you have actors, right, actors and actresses. So unlike a person who writes a book or it's jointly written by a book who might have, you know, influences and experiences from the world around him, this is much more complex films. Right. So all these things, and because it's not merely a work of a single person, a single filmmaker, but it's a collective work. And that is why I say cinema is an industry. Films are part of industry. So reading films is a different experience altogether. The latter half of my title of my lecture is the mise 
The mesosay, as most of you might know, is a uh, uh, term that uh, came out largely from France, be it for theater or for film. Basically, it means placing on stage. What do you see? What do you see in film at any given point of time is known as mesosay. Right? And it's absolutely important part of any film that you see, because that's the primary interface between the audience as well as the filmmaker. Whatever happens, whatever goes behind the scene, the audience is not aware of it. But what he or she sees on screen, that is what is he's obvious, he or she is obvious of it. So the audience interacts primarily based on mesosay. Right. So, this lecture will be primarily what are the important constituents of mesosay. We begin with something called setting, you know, that is perhaps the most important part of mesosay, right? Because you see, when you talk about mesosay, it's uh, uh, when, you, when you talk about general uh, audience going to film, what, it, what makes it attracting to the audience? What, it, what makes it attractive to the audience? Yes. The actors, brand names, the actresses, brand names, maybe at a later stage filmmaker, then genre. But what the audience actually goes and sees is the mesosay. And I assume that people who are attending this course either have past experience of film scholarship or maybe they are just, uh, you know, from different disciplines, avid watcher of films and now want to pursue scholarship on reading films. So, I am sure this lecture will be helpful to both categories of people. Coming back again, setting. What do you mean by setting? Setting, well, if mesosay means placing on stage, setting is the background of that stage, right? So, when, what, what do you see? What type of film is that? Whether you are talking about uh, historical film, whether you are talking about the geographical location of film, whether you are talking about the local effects of film. So, this is what we mean. Setting can be historical, setting can be geographical and setting of course can be local, right? And yes, setting can be rural, urban. So, what is important to observe over here that setting can be both physical as well as mental. And why should we use the word can? It is actually both physical as well as mental. So, setting impacts you physically when you see spaces, physical spaces within the film and it also has a psychological impact. Now, we begin with uh, uh, the first clip. I would urge you to see the first link, the first clip that portrays sound of music. Sound of music, of course, uh, most of you might uh, be aware was a Hollywood film, 1965. And uh, uh, just see this clip, just see this clip and then we'll analyze what it is to be done. Now, I am sure all of you have seen this clip. What does the clip tell you about the background, about the setting? Well, it gives you uh, uh, a landscape of infinite possibilities. So much space, look at the mountains, look at the 19, uh, I mean it, it talks about Austrian countryside. It is an example of rural landscape, a mountainous landscape. The bit of uh, story about this film is that here is this uh, young woman who is training herself to be a nun and she is suddenly told uh, to go to a retired person's villa in rural Austria and uh, look, after the seven, uh, look after seven children that he has. He is retired, his wife is no more there and children look after the children. So, he go, uh, she goes over there and takes care of uh, she is a governess in that sense, she takes care of those children. Now, unlike this uh, uh, retired naval officer who has been uh, upbringing, I mean bringing up his children full of discipline, rigorous discipline, much has to do much with uh, the navy background, we have this girl with infinite possible, she is a, I mean, I mean she is a um, person with a lot of independence, free spirited person as it were, free spirited individual. Now, that gets reflected when you see the setting of the film, because the setting of the film 
gives you glimpses of mountains. Free space gives you a, a landscape of free streams. So much space and, and, and this woman is singing a song. So, so that gives you an idea of rural landscape. So when you see as an audience for the first time and the beginning of this film, when you see this song, when you see the background, you automatically have an understanding of what this film is going to be all about. So this is, uh, this is an example of rural come mountainous landscape, right? So and that's a wilderness, nature in its wilderness. Now let us see the second clip. The second clip is about a semi-urban location. This is from Rear Window. Rear Window, uh, is, uh, as some of you might already be aware, is a renowned Hitchcock classic. Right? So let us look at this clip. Let us look at this clip and again we will discuss that clip. Yes. So, you must have already noted a difference between uh, the earlier clip that you saw and this clip. What can be the differences? Definitely space. Number one, if the earlier clip was about mountainous location, was about rural location, it was about countryside location, this is about more of a semi-urban or urban location. Now, what is the difference between the rural world and urban world? Confinement of spaces. So within a particular space, you would find there are so many houses, clusters of flats together. I mean, the modern equivalent is flats, but they have buildings together. And everybody is doing some sort of work. The camera moves, right? So camera moves from window to window, giving a glimpse. It's, uh, uh, the, uh, the location is Manhattan, Greenwich Village in Manhattan. That's the location of this film. And what, uh, so what, what does this uh, setting tells you, uh, tell you? This, this setting tells you that this is a world where there is a lot of confinement. This is an urban world where your free spiritedness will be curbed. And of course, the daily activities that these people are doing also gets reflected in that. Right? So the, you see, there is a stark difference between a rural landscape, mountainous landscape, and of course, the urban or semi-urban landscape. Now we move on to the next clip, which is very important as far as the setting of that film is concerned. Yes, this clip as all of you must, might have seen already, this is from Namaste London, which came out in 2007. And this is the initial part of the film with full credits and the initial introductory song that is going on, right. So, if you hear the lyrics, if you see the background, the activities that are carried out in the background, you will automatically see that there is a difference from the earlier two clips. Well, the earliest clip that you saw, clip number one, was of a rural countryside background. The second was of semi-urban, urban background. This third is about diasporic imagination. And it is a diaspora, world of diaspora, proper London, proper urban world, the heights of western civilization. And if you notice the script, uh, clip properly, if you see this clip properly, there are basically people shown who are from Asian subcontinent. So there are couple of Muslim people being shown, couple of Hindus, uh, non-Muslim people being shown. And, and yes, it, it can be, it can be that those Muslims are from India, those Hindus are from uh, Pakistan. But as of now, when we are focusing on this thing, we are focusing on Indian citizens, former Indian citizens, former Pakistani citizens, now settled in London. And what do we mean by diaspora? By diaspora, we mean people who have settled as part of communities in uh, uh, non-homeland spaces, and in this case, London, for a substantial period of time. Either they might have gone for some work, they might have gone for some project, we know there are different types of diaspora, or either they are in some sort of exile. But definitely this is about diasporic imagination. And what is this particular song trying to tell you? What is this particular trying, a clip trying to tell you? That people in diaspora have a unique experience. The clash between the homeland versus the host land, they all get reflected over here. Right? So, what are the diaspora, what are the concerns of diasporic individuals? Nostalgia. 
memory, past, all these things are revealed in this uh, particular clip that you are seeing because that is very important. There is a sense of loneliness when you see those characters. I mean, none of those characters are happy by the way. Those characters are just uh, shown either uh, immersed in their daily routine of work or they are walking with some sense of loneliness, some sense of strangeness that is uh, over there. Now, this is something which is very, very specific to uh, your diasporic individual. And the film itself, you know, what is Rishi Kapoor doing? The character played by Rishi Kapoor. Rishi Kapoor, of course, with his family from India, has settled in London for quite a long time. Now, Katrina Kaif is his wife. And when Katrina Kaif uh, becomes an a, I, I mean, age of marriage, attains the age of marriage, Rishi Kapoor wants that her, his daughter should be married to an Indian bridegroom. So he goes and settles over there. And remember one particular scene, those of you who have already watched that film, uh, when these two people, uh, Akshay Kumar and uh, Rishi Kapoor, they are conversing with each other in a, uh, in a park, in a desolated park, uh, then Akshay Kumar says, well, you all want to settle in England, but when you want to get your girls married, you want an Indian bridegroom. And that very much explains the crux of this film, the setting of the film that it's about diasporic concern and therefore the diasporic concern gets immediately reflected in the clip that you have seen. Now, now we move on to the next clip. The next clip is about uh, Kanchana, a movie which came out in 2011. This is about Telugu, uh, Tamil, sorry, this is about Tamil film. Of course, it has been remade, readapted and dubbed in Telugu also, in Malayalam in, and, and you also have the latest remake of it, Lakshmi Bomb in Akshay Kumar's case. Lakshmi Bomb, by the way, bombed, I mean, nothing against it, but Kanchana was very popular as a part of franchise of Muni too. So, let us quickly watch this film and then uh, clip and then we'll discuss that again. Yes. Now, what does this film uh, tells you? That what does this film show you? What is this movie clip all about? This movie clip shows you concerns of transgender individuals, transgender person. Uh, um, uh, contextually speaking, this film is about Aravani community. Aravani community, of course, are known as transgender, one of the transgender communities in India. And uh, so the concerns. So, so what does an average person have as far as the imagination of transgendered person goes, right? So when you are traveling places, like say you are in Delhi or Bombay or other places, and you are either traveling by public transport or private transport, and in the next traffic light you will encounter people, transgender people who will be asking for money. So what is the fear? that is shown or that an individual undergoes? Well, uh, again, it's just word of mouth stereotyping of things. It's just a part of folklore that people say that you should not, uh, you know, kind of make these transgender people angry because they will otherwise curse you. Now, you understand that this is also part of folklore and there is no truth behind it. Right, and what, is the, uh, and what is the fear? The fear is that they might curse you so that you might not have your next generation, you might not have children. So that fear is there. And another thing that comes to your mind, see traditionally speaking, the patriarchal world would want you to believe that there is a man, the male, and there is a woman, the female. And therefore, handsomeness and beautiful, being beautiful are associated with these two characters, right, or these two uh, species. And whatever is the other gender, the third gender, traditionally speaking, patriarchally speaking, I mean, I mean, that's what the patriarchal people would want you to believe that they can never be considered as beautiful or as handsome, right? Because they are othered. So this film, this clip that you have seen, talks about the psychological setting. Remember, in the beginning of setting thing, we ha I have told you that uh, setting can be physical as well as psychological, mental. So this setting is about psychological setting where the, the filmmaker is trying to show the stereotypes that are generally built around the character of transgender person, right? So this is what setting is all about. Setting is a very crucial component of mise 
Now we move on to the next component of mesose. The next component of uh, mesose will be lighting. Lighting just like setting is very important part of any film that you have seen. Or why even film? In our daily lives, life, uh, light plays a crucial role. I mean, see, it is a brightly lit sunny day versus the more gloomy uh, rainy season or autumnal uh, weather. We know there is a difference, there is a difference to it. Yes, some people might like sunny days, some people might like the more gloomy sort of autumnal weather, it is relative, but at the same point of time, these are two different things. Lighting plays a huge role. I mean, when we were growing up in different parts of our country, I am sure you must have realized at one point of time, there used to be tremendous load sheddings, uh, you know, in different parts of the country, especially during evening and night. So, that was a different experience altogether. Nowadays, in most places, well, I am talking about the metros to begin, to be very specific, you have almost 24 hours of light, almost. But this was not the case at that some point of time. So, coming back to cinema, lighting plays a crucial role. Lighting again can be of two types, high key lighting and low key lighting. What do you mean by high key lighting? What do you mean by key lighting? Key lighting is the basic main light. And when you say, uh, when you use the terminology high key lighting, you basically mean that the main light uh, is lit the brightest. That is the highest power of light, right? So, let us just understand this, uh, see this clip and then we will take this discussion about lighting further. Let us watch the fifth clip that I am going to show you. Yes, so as you have seen, this fifth clip is from DDLJ, Dilwale Dulenia Le Jayenge, a song. What is this clip all, all about? What is this film showing you? Number one, it is radiant. The film is, show you, is showing you uh, a mezose, which is radiant, brightly lit. So, you have Kajol, you have Shah Rukh Khan, they are romancing with their guitars and Tujhe Dekha To Ye Jana San, that is the song. What do you find? Totally brightness, total brightness, totally radiant, fully lit. What does it tell you? It tells you about emotions, particular type of emotions. What are those emotions? Emotions of love, emotions of romance, emotions of friendship, right? So, these are the things. Now, there are certain types of emotions which are uh, more uh, uh, suitable for high key light. And again, there are certain types of emotions like fear, anger, where you might not show high key light, you might show low key light, right? Let us see another clip uh, of high key lighting. Uh, let us see another clip of high key lighting. This is from the film Chandigarh Amritsar Chandigarh, a film, a Punjabi film, which came out in 2019. Itself a remake of Marathi film uh, Mumbai Pune Mumbai, very popular uh, the film. So, let us see, let us see this clip and we will discuss high key lighting again. Yes, so just like the Lavale Dulania Le Jayenge song, here you have the two characters interacting with each other, and this is a comic film, comedy film, you know, and this is a, of course a romance also is there, so it's going to be a romantic comedy film, that sense of the term. So you can see the lights, I mean, it's very, very uh, clear, bright, radiant, and when you have high key lighting, the first thing that uh, uh, you do is to get rid of shadows, because shadows come with different type of emotions. Shadows come with uh, some type of emotions that are not fully radiant, right? So, let us begin with low key light. What is low key light all about? Low key light, okay, let, let us first see this clip. This clip is from Shonar Killa. Shonar Killa uh, film Satyajit Ray directed which came out in 1974. And this film obviously talks about many things, but let us, let us see this clip and then we will figure that out. Uh, after you have seen this clip, what is the thing that first comes to your mind? The thing that first comes to your mind is that emergence of shadow. It is a Rajasthani background, the setting is Rajasthani, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, precisely Jaisalmer, that is the part of it. Now, Jaisalmer is talking about uh, uh, a treasure hunt, right? And so, there is this uh, community which is singing folk songs at night, 
and the film is shot. So unlike the other two high key lighting clips that you have seen, you must have imagined or must have figured out that this is a different clip. What is the difference? The difference is the emergence of shadow. The difference is about the uh, darkness playing a major role. And this is a mystery no, uh, 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 film. You know, it's a mystery detective film, largely a part of uh, Satyajit Ray and Shomitra Chatterjee uh, combo and the way it uh, enacted, right? So unlike the romantic films, you have thriller, you have mystery over there. Now let us quickly look at the next clip. The next clip is from film Bhut. That film Bhut was, I mean, uh, was made in 2003, Ram Gopal uh, uh, Verma, and you have uh, this whole Urmila Matron. It's a horror film. So let us quickly see this clip. Yes, so this clip, just like the preceding clip, again has to do with darkness, right? So spirit possessed Urmila Matronkar's character comes out in the darkness, kills or murders the uh, Chaukidar or Darban of that whole complex and of course it moves, the film moves while Ajay Devgan is just merely drinking and it comes up. So the, look at the lighting of it. The lighting of it is, yes, you might argue that there is a bright uh, lampshade over there, there are several lights lit over there, but again, at the same point of time, it's the darkness which controls and therefore lighting is a very important part of Mizose because low key lighting again talks about certain genres of films like uh, thrillers, like mystery films and of course like horror. Now one thing one needs to be careful about that any film can have both high key and not one can have, actually has both high key lighting as well as the low key lighting throughout. It's not possible to make a film totally on high key light. I'm talking about commercial two and a half hour cinema. Similarly, it's not possible to make a film totally full of low key lighting. But there will be films where high key lighting uh, scenes outnumber the low key lighting. Similarly, the low key lighting scenes outnumber the high key. So that will depend upon what the genre of that film is. The third component is of costumes. Costumes play a crucial role. You know, costumes in Mizose, in cinema, just like in real world, can be markers of class, caste, and gender. Depending upon the costumes that characters in films wear, you can immediately make out what can be the general background of that character. Whether that character is, belongs to upper class or lower class, whether that character belongs to upper caste or lower caste, and also it can be a marker of gender and of course sexuality, right? So you have cross-dressing also emerging over there. Now, let us quickly look at this clip. This is from Spider-Man. Let us look at this clip. So all of us are aware, whether it's Spider-Man or Batman or um, uh, your Superman, what it does? It actually creates an unearthly type of superhero, right? So Spider-Man can do something, Batman can do something, which we can't. And therefore, what do we, uh, uh, how do we differentiate them? We differentiate them with a specific costume. Remember, our own Indian superhero, um, television superhero, you know, uh, Shakti Man. He also had a specific type of dress. And of course, those dresses, those wear yeah, then become part of popular imagination. So you have children going to shops, buying those particular type of dresses, right? So that costume plays an important role. And in those films, like Spider-Man and Superman, you would find that common people are wearing common clothes like us, right? But the hero, that is the Spider-Man or the villain, they will be given a different attire. So costumes play a huge role because here costume talks about the supermanliness of a particular character. So after the Spider-Man clip, let us now look at the next clip. And this will be clip number 10. Look at the clip and then we'll discuss again. Yes. So you must have understood by now, this is from a Telugu film, Telugu film Bahubali. Now Bahubali, as we can see and we can show, is a you know semi-historical, semi-mythical uh, type of film, right? It's fantasy film. So as you can see, the characters, all the characters, all people that are shown in that film actually are wearing specific type of dresses. 
specific type of costumes. Now, those costumes of course, present to you a specific type of meaning, a specific type of historicity, a specific type of mythical. Remember in Spider-Man, you had common people like us wearing costumes, common costumes as well as the superhero. But this is the thing where you have different, all people, all people within that film wearing a different era clothings, right? So that is very important. Now look at the next clip that you have. Yes. So this uh, 11th clip that you have seen is a, uh, you know, is a, a particular song, a cabaret song picturized on Helen. Remember costumes, as I told you also is marker of what type of uh, gender we represent, right? So women, for example, right, can, uh, I mean, traditionally speaking, or this is how patriarchy wants us to believe with a stereotype that there will be good women, there will be bad women good women supposed to be staying within the confinement of uh, the four walls of domesticity, the bad woman or the fallen woman would be the one who would go out, right? So films have also reflected this uh, very biased messages in their films. Uh, the cabaret uh, dancing would be an act of it. You have Helen's character. What is Helen doing? She is a cabaret dancer and the cabaret dancer, of course, uh, in the traditional concept of uh, femininity would be as the other fallen woman, the other woman who is supposed to be or traditionally seen as someone who destroys the uh, life of or the family life of the hero and all that such. Right? Now, what I am trying to say and show you is that this particular character, the cabaret dancer has a particular type of costume. And you, as you have seen in the initial part of this particular clip that you have this uh, heroine coming in in salwar kurta or churidar and of course she is hiding her face because this is not supposed to be a good place for a woman to be it. And in contrast to that you have the more forward Helen, you know the cabaret dancer played by Helen. So clearly the lines are divided between the good woman as well as the so called fallen woman or the bad woman. So this is what we understand when we talk about how costume play a role in uh, creating situations, uh, in creating uh, uh, markings of uh, women, you know, of femininity within that, they have a very crucial role. Let us move on to the 12th clip, the last clip of the costume section. And this is from the film Anum Penum, uh, a film, uh, a Malayalam film which just came out in 2021. Uh, it's an OTT release, so just let us look at it. Yeah. So, this film, I will very quickly summarize. This film is about three uh, eras of uh, women, uh, three, uh, three different historical periods of women. Now, if you focus on uh, the three female uh, trailers that I have basically shown you trailers, clips of the trailer, you will see that there are three different stories and there are three different women. The costume makes a huge difference. The first thing the first uh, anthology, uh, the first part of the anthology, the first film will show you one particular woman who is a domestic uh, helper, is uh, wearing a different type of clothes compared to the other women who are there in the family. So other women are fully clad with sari. This one is only with uh, the blouse. There is no sari as such blouse and uh, the petticoat that thing. Now that was very crucial because it reflects a particular time in the history of Kerala where lower class and lower caste women were also never allowed to wear or, to or, the, or totally hide the upper part of the body. They would be wearing blouse. So that is the working woman's dress of those times. Now you look at the second clip. The second clip is about uh, uh, a woman who is self-employed again in the uh, village side and she, of course, is uh, wearing a sari because it's a different historical pattern. But it also talks about how history or how society in Kerala has moved or has uh, I mean transiting from in different eras. The third clip, of course, shows a college-going girl, and like just like any of the contemporary situation, you know, contemporary occasions, uh, you will find that that particular girl is also wearing just like any of us will wear clothes, right? So again, costume within the same film makes a huge difference because these are three different eras. These are three different historical periods. So costume induces the viewpoint of the filmmaker 
into the audience who would want to see. Now let us quickly move on to the next uh, component of uh, Mizose, the props. I won't talk much in that sec in this section. I'll just show you a couple of clips. The first clip is about style of Rajnikant, right? And this is an accumulation of several uh, clips or, uh, from several films where he is shown playing or uh, you know kind of fiddling with his goggles or with his glasses. Now, this is all we know. Now, let's quickly watch this. Yes. So, and we all are, are aware of uh, Rajnikant films and, and this is something that we associate with him, you know, playing with uh, uh, glasses. Just like he has a unique style of, uh, you know, a smoking cigarette, lighting cigarette, you know, typical uh, Rajnikant style. And the point is that these two are specifically styles associated with Rajnikant. What do we understand by prop? In a scene, in a mise when you are particularly watching a film, there will be inanimate objects throughout, right? Like, uh, let's say, let's say you are talking about Pothir Panchali, you have the train scene. Train is a prop over there in Mizos, uh, part of Mizose. Then you will have uh, the burning train, the burning train in Hindi film, again the train is thing. Then you have films like Dhoom, right, which will have bikes. Similarly, you might have films dedicated to cars, not only films which are dedicated to any particular items, but any inanimate objects that is there, those are props. They can be there in your theater and they are also there in your films, right. So this is what props is. So props can be the glasses of Rajnikanth too. And the point is that throughout the film, he is shown playing with his glasses in a particular unique manner. Now this becomes a brand when we notice that in his filmography over a period of time, he has been playing with glasses in different, different ways in almost all his films, in many of his films at least. So it becomes a brand Rajnikant. Just like Rajnikant is a brand, this prop of glasses become brand. So when you uh, visualize, when you imagine about Rajnikant, this thing comes to your mind automatically. The fiddling with glasses or fiddling with uh, uh, cigarette. That is unique Rajnikanth. Let us quickly move on to the next Tamil film uh, actor, Vijay's clips. Again, just like uh, this one will play with glasses or cigarette, Vijay would be known as a unique way of uh, taking chewing gum or bubble gum. So let us see this clip. Yeah, so this was the 14th clip that I have shown you. And this is Vijay. And you have seen, again, just like brand Rajnikanth, you have a brand Vijay, Talap, uh, Talapati Vijay. And you see, he is also known. So when you visualize about Vijay, when you imagine about Vijay, the uh, one of the things that will definitely come to your mind is his unique way of taking bubble gum or taking chewing gum. So that is specific. So this is brand Rajnikanth and this is brand Vijay. So props can become, indeed can become brands. Similarly, uh, just like ordinary props would. The third and the uh, last clip that I would show you in this prop section would be from the film Shole. So when Gabbar Singh is introduced for the first time, he is introduced with belt and that belt becomes a very popular one. So uh, quickly watch this uh, clip. Yes, so this clip as you have seen is the entry point of Gabbar Singh. So what is shown? Of course, uh, you also hear, you not only see, you are also hearing, right? And you hear the footsteps of this iconic villain, Gabbar Singh, as well as the uh, uh, sound of the belt that is carrying over it. So when he moves from left to right and right to left, you see not his face first, but the belt, the belt of uh, Gabbar Singh over there. And the belt, of course, plays an important role, not only in this film, but in the iconic imagination of this character. So in that sense, belt becomes a very important prop. Of course, belt, unlike the Rajnikant brand or the Vijay uh, brand, is uh, limited to this film only. So it doesn't become a brand. But nevertheless, it's a very important part of uh, the film, the film the, and, and the introduction of this iconic villainous character. 
Now we move on to the next section. This is a very important section. This section talks about colors, right? See, we all know uh, films have evolved from merely black and white cinemat cinematography to that of color. Of course, there were different uh, ways of defining that. You can call them as technicolor, whatever colors you might talk about, Eastman color. But the point is that colors play a huge role. How do colors play a huge role? Colors play a huge role primarily based on three components, hue, brightness, and of course, saturation. What is hue? Hue is the basic color, of course, the color scheme within the film. Brightness, of course, would mean the lightness or the heaviness associated with that color. And number three, saturation, the intensity. All these three constitute, constitute the color schema of any film and that is very important. I won't say much about color scheme. Let me show you this clip. This is a pretty longish clip, but I would uh, request you to watch it very patiently. This clip is from a Tamil film which talks about caste discrimination. And midway through this clip, precisely at 2 minutes 16 seconds, you will find that this clip talks about, uh, uh, you, this clip will actually show you blue coloration blue color and uh, so, so first see this uh, clip and then we will talk about the uh, relevance or the value of the blue color, the characteristic associated with it. So quickly watch it. Right, so this was the 16th clip that you saw, the first clip in the section of colors. Now. I will quickly summarize the story. What is the story about? This story is about discrimination faced by a uh, village boy. The village boy uh, grows up in a village from uh, the up, uh, lower caste of the society. He comes to the city, he uh, tries to get education, he falls in love with an upper caste woman. And what happens? The uh, family members of the upper caste woman, they actually beat him up. They uh, uh, do many, many things to exploit him from physical beating to psychological torture, they are raped. Now, in the scheme of Dalit politics or Ambedkarite politics, you all of us know that color blue is associated with something very special, something very uh, important political message, you know, that blue, color blue. Now, till the first half of the clip, you saw that this is about psychological dark colors maybe, you know, had different type of color scheme at that point of time. Midway through it, you have the blue coloration coming in. First, the blue emerges in the face of or the body of uh, the dog, that emerges. And by the way, in the initial part of this film, the dog is also killed, right? And this is a battle between the caste, the upper caste and the lower caste, the dog falls the victim of it. So, the dog is killed and of course, uh, when the color blue emerges in the dog's face and the dog's body, it is coming with a specific message made by the filmmaker. And what is this message all about? This message is about exploitation that lower caste people have to face. Similarly, when he knows that the girl, right, uh, will, I mean, I mean, he loves her, she loves him, but their affair might not... Uh, flourish into some sort of relationship because of caste discrimination. So, the blue color also emerges on uh, the body or the face of the woman. The blue color also obviously emerges on the character's main body, his face, because the character of course is actually, uh, you know, at the center of this discrimination, right. So, you understand how blue color takes place, but, uh, but, but you know, this is only this film specific. For example, blue in any other film might have a different symbolism. Uh, if you remember uh, any film, let us say for example, Anand, you know, 1970s, you have Rajesh Khanna and Amitabh Bachchan. What do you see? You see blue skies, hmm? Zindagi Kabhi Ye Paheli and that song, if you remember, it is a blue sky or the blue seas, sea. Right. So, this is exactly, it changes from film to film. So, you have to capture the, uh, uh, the message that that particular film is trying to say. So, red color, for example, in a horror film or a thriller film would give you fear because of the blood. In, let us say, a romantic film, red color might be 
that uh, film of romance, symbol of romance, symbol of union, rose, you see. So, it depends, it depends on what type of film you are watching and what is the message that you are trying to convey. I will end this uh, particular section of Mizose, uh, the color section with the second, uh, the last uh, uh, precisely speaking, um, 17th clip with that and this is from uh, uh, Dalkir Salman film, right? Nitya Menon and Dalkir Salam, uh, Salman Malayalam film, 100 Days of Love. Just, I'll just focus on the coloration of this game and then we'll talk about it. Yeah, so the 17th clip that you have seen, the 17th clip, what does it talk about? Well, it, uh, but do you find that any particular color is being represented with intensity over there? No, it does not. It does not. Unlike the earlier scheme that earlier clip that you saw, where a particular focus was there on a particular color, here it is not the case. Because here everything, uh, I would say the impact of the color is muted or toned down. Why? Because it might create a different message altogether. And what is this message? This message is about the beginning of friendship the beginning of love, the beginning of romance between the two characters and it is from 100 days of love, it is a, it's a very, very popular Malayalam romantic film and of course, uh, just focus on the uh, scooter, the scooter might have, might look or appear to be of a different generation, of a different time period, yes it is, it is the vintage scooter, you know. And of course, there is a history, those of you who will watch this film will understand the relevance of bringing that vintage uh, scooter over here. But what it does, it actually gives you an idea, it gives you an idea of romance that is flourishing between the two characters, right. The character, uh, of course, the hero and the heroine, right. So, that is there, this is the 17th scheme. Now, the last component of Mizose that we will discuss over here today is the aspect ratio. Aspect ratio, well, might appear to be more theoretical about it, technical thing, but do not worry about it. From a common person's imagination, just imagine, when you watch films, whether it is a black and white film or a 80s film or a 90s film or current film, you might have observed from time to time that, uh, you know, the, the border of the screen, it seems to have a black border. You know, so for example, in some films you will have a square formation of body, I mean the high, uh, the width as well as the height, the width and the height, so the screen and in some films you will have a different configuration of the scheme. Well, these are very important things because if you are aware of how filmmaking goes, how audiences receive, it is very, very important. Very quickly, well, I mean, there are endless number of uh, aspect ratios. What do you mean by aspect ratio, by the way? Technically speaking, as, uh, aspect ratio for a film or a, uh, or a television serial or a TV program is the proportional relationship between the width and the height, the width and the height. And when it all began in uh, 1890s, when cinema began for the first time, the thing that uh, the aspect ratio that was very common, very popular was 4 is to 3. 4 is of course the width and 3 is the height. So, that was the proportional relationship on screen between the width and the height, 4 by 3, right. And of course, you will see uh, as the film cinema evolved, you had different aspect ratios also getting developed. You had in 1950s onwards, you had uh, the wide screen aspect ratio, right. So, the aspect ratio will change very much. In fact, it uh, uh, it is from anywhere between 2.75 2, uh, 2 by 1 or anything. In fact, 2.75 by 1 is the ultra wide screen thing. And the, uh, the film that is very much reminiscent with that is that of uh, uh, Ben Hur, you know. It was used to show the wideness, the possibility of wideness of this film. So, let us quickly watch both these clips together, clip number 18 and clip number 19. And then we will discuss this thing again. Yeah. So, I mean, you must have seen 
the difference between those two clips, one clip number one were a clip number 18th rather, if you keep the entire lecture in mind, was from uh, the film Algiers, 1938, and the next film was from Ben Hur. Uh, that is 1959, I think, something in the 1950s. Now, what happens? You can see the difference. When you come to Ben Hur, the width has increased of the screen. The height has not increased that much. But when you focus on the Algiers, 4 is to 3, there seems to be more or less a balanced representation of width and height, right? So, aspect ratio also plays an important role in creating drama in creating dramatic situations. Of course, it has also to do with, you know, uh, behind the camera sort of development of film, uh, uh, film material, like film, uh, uh, the film materials that you have, right, the film stock, that is also there. But it also makes a huge impact on screen in the mesosse. So, these two will have different impact. For the first time, for example, in Ben Hur, people were suddenly watching in theater and was seeing such width and they felt, oh my God, we have seen almost entire what the uh, filmmaker wanted to uh, show in that particular scene. That might not have been possible in the non-widescreen cinema, uh, the example of which we saw in LGS, right? So, they play a major role. So, today we have discussed these important constituents of the mesosse and I am sure it must have been uh, both entertainment as well as learning experience for you and I am sure that you would also want to see film and then of course the next time when you see films, you know, you must consider all these things together and I am sure automatically it will come to your mind because now you have moved beyond a mere uh, common uh, film watcher to that of a film watcher who reads films, who has more scholarly approach to films, right? So, okay, thank you so much. Have a nice day.